What is going on, everybody? I'm Mike, joined by AJ Sabelski of the Batavia Daily News. And today, we are excited to have an NFL mock draft for the Buffalo Bills. We're one week away uh, from the draft taking place. And AJ and I are going to give our thoughts on what the Bills should do and what we think they will do. AJ, how you doing tonight, man? Good, man. Uh, just had some excellent wings based on your recommendations and others below some of my posts. Some sunny reds, very good wings. Had some medium sunny special sauce kind of thing. Great blue cheese. So, yeah, I'm feeling good. Um, and then I'm also doing some high school roundups tonight. So life is good. So first off, uh, I'm going to just start out this show by saying this is not going to be your typical diving deep into every single prospect available. I think by now, uh, most Bills fans know who the main wide receivers are, uh, what their skill sets are, what they bring to the table. We're going to talk at the beginning of this uh, more so about the possibilities of what they can do. Will they trade up? Will it be a big move? Will it be a small move? Will they stay put at 28? Or is a trade back uh, in play uh, with this move uh, right now with the NFL draft in the next week? So, AJ, let's just start out with the, the first mega scenario. How realistic do you think it is that the Bills will make a move into the top 10 to go after a guy like Malik Neighbors or Romo Dunze? Yeah, so with Brandon Bean, again, you never know. He spoke today. He said he would be willing to part ways with that first round pick next year if the case were, you know, if he, want, he wants to go to bed on Thursday night knowing that he got the guy he wanted. So if that is the case and he feels like, the guy he really wants is attainable and they feel like they can give draft capital to obtain him. I think it's a possibility. How likely is that to happen? Probably very unlikely. I would say at this point, I think the bills are content with kind of that, not middle tier, but after those three receivers, after neighbors, Odunze and Harrison jr. Who's probably going to go in the top five. There's not really that major of a drop off from guys from like four to 11. They all have different skill sets. They all bring different kind of ability at the NFL level where the bills can kind of utilize that with Joe Brady. So will, will it happen? It could potentially, if they really want that true number one receiver, sorry about that. But the overwhelming thing to me is I think the bills want to, get a combination of guys. That's where I'm at right now. Maybe they do get that number one. Maybe Brian Thomas Jr. falls. Maybe uh, Adonai Mitchell falls. But I think as of now, I'm, I'm thinking that they go with a combination double dip in the top 100 at some point, maybe trade back into the third round. So I'm I'm with you. I was all about trading into the top 10 for a Romo Dunze or a Malik Neighbors. Uh, I had a video about it last week where I was saying, I'm all in. Just do it. Get the get the guy that you know is going to be a guaranteed star in the NFL. I'm still not against the idea. I know a lot of people are worried about giving up future picks, high assets for a guy uh, like Odunze or Neighbors. Even though they'll be a star, you're, you're kind of sacrificing the future in other ways uh, with a young team where you're going to need depth and other players filling in in the future. I still think those three guys are a tier above everyone else in this draft, and when you lose a guy like Stephon Diggs, it does um, it does leave a hole. You are losing an alpha, and I would like to replace an alpha with another person that has that ability to step up. But as time goes on, I am with you. I think it's less and less likely. Now, what I don't think is incredibly unlikely is a move up to the late teens or early 20s for a guy like Brian Thomas Jr. Now, I know a lot of people say he's raw, that – they're concerned still about making a move like that when uh, he might fall and a guy like Adonai Mitchell, some of these other guys like Xavier Leggett will be uh, available at 28. What are your thoughts about making a slight move up for a guy like Thomas or Adonai Mitchell out of Texas? Yeah, the thing for me is I think, again, when you get past those top three receivers, the next bunch, the next group, you know, Mitchell, uh, Brian Thomas Jr., guys like that that you just mentioned, I think they're they're not a complete package. You're not going to bring that complete package right away based on from what I've read and what I who I've talked to among, you know, NFL media, whatever the case may be. I just think there's – is there really a point to go up and give up assets for someone at 20 and a Brian Thomas Jr. when you could trade back 
or stay at 28 and get a Trey Franklin or a Keon Coleman or a Leggett or whomever the Bills desire at that spot. I, I don't know. It, it, it'll be interesting to see what they do. But again, I think Josh Allen, he said in his presser today, and, and I kind of got out of context. He kind of made a point that Joe Brady has really taken the reins of this offense and wanted to and wanting to spread the ball, go through his progressions and find the open man. I think some people took that as, oh, Josh Allen doesn't go through progressions. Like, what an idiot. No, I, I don't think that was the case. I think it was more so with Dable and Dorsey, it was more of a steadfast approach in getting Stephon Diggs the ball. And if he doesn't get open, kind of figure it out. Um, and that doesn't mean Allen hasn't gotten through progressions. He's done it in his career. It's not a concern. But I think with Joe Brady, they're really going to – high in on and focus on getting the ball to playmakers in their hands, get yards after the catch. Again, like an Xavier Worthy, that's another name that if he's at 28, do you really feel the need to trade up eight spots and lose draft picks later in the rounds when you have a guy that runs a 4-1-9 and you can get the ball in his hands with speed and he can get you yards after the catch? So it'll really be all up to the, what the Bills determine, how their board looks. I don't know how their board looks, the consensus board. Obviously, it looks different than what the Bills are probably thinking. But I'm of the point on it. It's funny. I've kind of not done a full 360, but in the past couple of days, I'm really at the point where any route they go, I'd be okay with. But I do like the idea more and more of either staying at 28 or trading back, acquiring an extra third-round pick, and then getting two guys in that top 60 or top 90, 100, whatever that may be, to add to what you already have with Kincaid, Cook, Shakir, Samuel. So that's kind of where I'm at. If they do trade up to the late teens, early 20s, I'm not going to be upset about it. I think they could utilize a guy like Brian Thomas Jr., 11 touchdowns in college, very good production, very good speed, 4 3 3 40 at the combine. But I think you could stay at 28 or find a guy in the early second round if you trade back that could do what Brian Thomas Jr. could do. Maybe not as quickly, but over the course of a season. So this is where I'm kind of divided. I don't think you necessarily need to trade up for a Brian Thomas Jr. Because there are guys out there that I think aren't far off from what he can provide that will fall to 28. But I do think, in my opinion, that there is a little bit more uncertainty with the crop of guys that Bills fans and Bills media have been talking about at 28 compared to what we are talking about in a Brian Thomas Jr. I feel pretty confident that Brian Thomas Jr. is going to be a very good NFL player. I can't tell you with certainty that a Xavier Leggett, that a Ladd McConkey, a Troy Franklin are going to be great at the next level. It's They, they all are very skilled and they, they all have huge upside. But it does start to become a little bit of throwing the darts and hoping that you pick the right guy in that scenario. It, it's the the it's the whole age, age old debate. What there's no certainty in the NFL draft. We all know that. But the higher you pick, the higher the chance of landing a player that is going to be a difference maker. The Bills have a lot of talent on their team already. Trading down, getting a few more darts, it might come in handy. But the, the, the argument can be said that when you already have a team that is in the middle of a Super Bowl window, is it the right time to be throwing darts or should you be trying to get that final piece? And if you believe that a player is a tier above someone else, is it the responsible thing to do to let that guy go in hopes that maybe this guy or this other guy could be that same level of talent? Yeah, B made an interesting comment today, too, about he. there's more first-round grades for the Bills this year than there were last year, but not 28. So they don't have 28 first-round grades. So if they if they stay at 28, the likelihood that they pick a first-round graded guy, I'm not going to say it's like unlikely because maybe they have a guy graded in the first round that a team passed on or the team's ahead of them passed on. But the Bills last season had an opportunity to trade back. And instead, of course, Josh Allen sent the text to Brandon Bean, said Dalton Kincaid. Brandon Bean got aggressive, found the pass catcher that Josh Allen wanted. Now, there was a scenario where they could have trade, traded back, and Brandon Bean felt like that was a very good deal, and he was very adamant that that could have happened if they decided not to trade up for Kincaid. So if the case comes to, look, 
we'll trade back. And he also mentioned to my point that the first round grades that they have compared to the early second round grades is like a slim margin. Like one guy, his yards after the catch ability isn't as good, but he's got really good hands and he can win 50, 50 balls or, you know, or vice versa. So basically what I assumed from that press conference is at 28, the guy that's graded 20, if they have a receiver and a guy at 35, is there that much of a difference where you don't feel comfortable with both? That's the decision they'll have to make. And again, he said the the difference between the end of the first round grades and the end of the, or the beginning of the second round grades are close, but the beginning of the second round grades to the end of the second round grades are astronomically different. So that is interesting to me. I, I think there's once you get that past, like the, past that top forty, I think I think things change a lot. So so we'll see what happens. Now, I, I do want to ask you about receiver it, it seems like since the Stefan Diggs trade everyone is in receiver or bust mode are are you at that point in the first round at least I don't think I am at receiver or bust because again there's scenarios where like you could add a Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon if you really believe that he's the best guy available and you're like well maybe they, we can get aggressive in the second round and trade up and get a guy and then get a Javon Baker later or Brennan Rice, something something like that. But I don't think it's a necessity to get a first round receiver, but I do think it's almost a necessity unless they go the, the trade route and get a veteran or go in the veteran free agent market. There's guys like OBJ still out there. I, I think it's almost a necessity if they do not go the free agent route, which again, that's yet to be told. So it's kind of hard to predict that they need to come away with two receivers in this draft. I think I feel more strongly about that and adding depth like the, you know, like a Green Bay Packers when they added Christian Watson and they had a Romeo Dobbs, they added Jaden Reed. They went that route where it's kind of, let's just go by a unit. Let's not focus on one guy. Joe Brady showed that in Carolina, he can utilize multiple pieces. He made Curtis Samuel uh, a 1,000 yard player, DJ Moore a 1,000 yard player, Mike Davis, the running back, and a 1,000 yard player. So he has shown the ability that he doesn't truly need that alpha guy. So I think I'm more of the belief that no, I don't, they don't need to go receiver in the, in the first round, but I think they do need to come away with two rookies that can develop in this offense. So my thought process is this, if they don't trade back, so if they don't trade back from 28 and acquire more picks to where they can double dip at receiver in the second, later in the draft, then I, I, I really am in the mode where I really do want a receiver at 28. I don't want to say receiver or, or bust, but that's never the case. What, what if a what if a Latu falls or what, like you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, there's never a or bust scenario. I think like if you if you're ever at a or bust like a wide receiver or bust mindset going into a draft, you're probably you're up for disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree. And that's why I'm not going to go all the way to receiver or bust. But right. if, if it's a scenario where they're they're taking uh, a non-receiver in the first round, defensive tackle, an edge, um, a, another position of need. And then they're waiting till 60. It does create uh, a sense of uncertainty with the position going later into the offseason where you might need another move via trade or free agency to really sure up uh, the receiver room. I don't know if I can trust the receiver room going into the season with Samuel Shakir and then one of the tier three receivers at, at pick 60 without another uh, addition. I know that Kincaid is going to be one of the main targets this year, and that's why a lot of people are saying, well, you don't need an alpha. Uh, I get it. I was all team spread the ball around uh, in, for a long time, and, I, and I'm totally fine in those scenarios, but I don't know if, you can, if I can comfortably say that I would trust Shakir being the number two target receiver on this team behind Samuel or, or them sharing that with a second round pick that isn't uh, a Xavier Legatter won the higher end uh, second round guy. So not going to go receiver or bust, but there would have to be another move to really give me uh, confidence in that room uh, heading into the season. Now, before we start the mock draft, I just want to talk about thing? Can I have one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. Because we've talked about this in the past. There's a lot of people, and, and I, I agree to an extent, but I'd never fully like agreed with it, that believe – you know, you got to force feed digs, right? Like all, all over your timeline, if the Bills offense are struggling, like you got to get digs involved. You have to get things involved. 
Now imagine like this is this is a new coming, like sort of like a Josh Allen even said it today, like kind of a new wave of his career, seventh season. You're you're now your your contract's fully kicked in. You let go of very important veterans because of the cap space. I I hope that we don't have to hear, and, and it probably will happen because maybe Donald Cade will have like a, a really good game. But like imagine a world where, where like there's all these people talking about. No, you should get Shakir the ball. You should get Samuel the ball. Now, it'll be good discourse, right? It'll, it'll be good discourse. But in a way, I think that will help the Bills. Like, I, I'm not saying that force-feeding digs and getting him involved was not good and their offense wasn't good or elite under that. But I think when you have a quarterback as talented as Josh Allen, who's made guys like John Brown and Cole Beasley and Robert Foster very talented players, I think sprinkling the ball around – with an offense, with playmakers, with guys that can go down the field, guys that can beat you underneath, guys that can separate. I think that is so important, and I think that's kind of what the Bills are trying to show. And, again, who knows? James Cook, they ran the ball a lot, so that's another facet of this offense that they can utilize. So I'll, I'll say this. There's pros and cons to having an alpha and not having an alpha. So you have a guy like Diggs. You force feed him the ball. You throw, you throw it to him probably more than you should at times. Is that a negative? Yes, that can be a negative because there's other guys on your offense that you're neglecting and there might be guys open at times that you're just not, your instinct isn't even to look their way because you know you have an alpha that will command the ball, that will demand the ball and more often than not make quality plays. So deserving to go to uh, at all times. But at the detriment of it is, like you said, there are times that you should spread things out and, and open things up. And sometimes you don't do what you should be doing because you have an alpha uh, at in your offense. But it, like I said, pros and cons. More often than not, I would rather have uh, one of those star go-to guys because when it's a third and seven, third and six, I want to have a guy that I know is going to win his matchup more often than not and have my quarterback confident he can throw the ball there and the play is going to be there to be made. Now, there is some concerns. Like I, I understand that a lot of people right now are saying, well, if you have a Shakir, you have a Samuel, you have a Kincaid. Well, if you draft a, a Lad McConkey or one of these other guys, yes, you won't have a true number one, but you can spread it out. There's a lot of benefits to where you're going to have a lot of smart receivers on the field that are going to know how to use space, get open, and um, basically uh, give Josh a lot of opportunities to spread the wealth around. But then there will come opportunities where are you going to have that guy that you trust will beat man coverage or press coverage or do you have that vertical threat that can get deep? Because you don't want your offense suddenly to just be nickel and diming where you're throwing seven, eight yards every single time, and it's all this underneath stuff. You need to have a guy that can open things up uh, for everyone else. So I, I can see it both ways. Now, what is your, I guess, preferential scenario playing out for the Bills? Now, I, I'll, I'll preface by saying this, and I'll, and I'll tell you my opinion secondly. Staying at 28, trading down, trading up. And if you had one or two players in mind right now, best case scenario for the Bills, day one, day two, what are you thinking? Well, yeah, I mean, the dream, like the ideal guy, if they could do it, would be Odunze. Like if they could go up to 10, like that, like that's where I am more fond of the idea of going into the top 10, going to that Bears pick saying, hey, Chicago, look, man, like you already got. Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, Cole Komet. You, you have a lot of talent there. You're going to add probably another receiver uh, in this draft. Tra tra trade with us. We'll see, see what can happen. But that's like what I prefer in terms of like, I don't want them to go to 18 and get Brian Thomas Jr. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that like, I'm not against that. Like I'll warm up to it. I think he's a good player, but I think Odunze just brings so much number one, 1000 yard, 100 catch guy. Like, tomorrow like if they draft him tonight he, like he would wake up tomorrow like that so i go back and forth mike like one day i'll wake up and i'll be like man if they trade back i was listening to lockdown bills with joe marino and he trades back and gets lad mcconkey and xavier Legat. if you like you you trade yeah. back and get lad and xavier be nice. That'd be, that would be that would change how we would think about all this if That's you knew not. you could right. you could get those two guys right so like say they trade back and get a uh xavier worthy in a Keon Coleman or a, a Troy Franklin and a Jalen Polk, or, you know, they could go so many routes with it that I do like the idea. I'm telling you, and I might be, might be crazy. 
But right now, in this moment, I'll probably change it tomorrow. <laughs> but if they can trade back, and maybe we can play this out in the mock and see what can happen, going and getting two dudes, add to this receiver room. If you're not still not confident with Matt Collins, Shakir, Samuel, and the two rookies, go and get an extra guy in free agency or via trade and see what happens. But if you do go to, I'm not, I don't think they'll do that. But um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I, tomorrow I could be like, you know what, man, like well, let's stay at 28 and just pick Adonai Mitchell or, you know what I mean? So who, who knows? Uh, I'll right put you now, on the spot right, right now. I'll put you on the spot. This isn't part of our mock draft, but this is our pre mock draft uh, prediction. Who do the bills pick one week from today in the first round? <laughs> this isn't part of the mock draft because we're not obviously going through all the selections right, right. now. But if if you were just to go out there and throw a name, and I'm not going to hold you to this because we all know this is guesswork and that there's 10 million different scenarios this could go. But who is your gut saying, I think this guy is going to be a bill in a week? So based on talking to people, based on going through mocks, reading NFL draft analyst work, going reading multiple mocks, seeing what where these players are going, I would have to go with Adonai Mitchell from Texas. I, I think that would be the most realistic. He, on the PFF big board, he's 28th best you know, rated prospect. He's universally being selected in those early to mid-20s, late 20s in every mock I see. Um, he, he's kind of in that tier below BTJ, uh, you know, in the, in the top three. I, I won't name them all again. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think Adonai Mitchell, 6'2", boundary presence, Effort concerns. I mean, I get that, but I was talking to Pro Anthony Cover One at the at the Potathon at the McKinley Mall last weekend. He's like, everyone takes routes off. Like, if you're if you're going 100 percent on every play at the NFL, then you're like not human. Like you're a superhero. So <laughs> I think Adonai Mitchell makes the most sense based on upside, instant impact, deep threat ability, body control, all the things you want in a potential boundary receiver. I know there's a diabetes concern that came out Tyler Dunn's article from go long, but I mean, Hey, that it, it, the bills know more than we do. So if that's a guy they believe they can, you know, help become that number one presence for Allen in the future, then yeah, I think Adam Mitchell would make the most sense at 28. So I'm going to comment a few things about first trading into the top 10. So what I will say this normally, I don't think trading into the top 10, for a receiver makes a lot of sense. There's only a few scenarios where I personally am in favor of it. And it's when you already have a franchise quarterback in place and you have a solid roster in place, both of which the bills have. I, I know a lot of people have talked about the bills having holes to fill and that uh, their team is losing out on its window. I couldn't disagree more. You look at this bills offense, they're solid left guard to right guard. Uh, you look at the receiver room. That's a glaring need. Tight end, solid. Um, quarterback, solid. Defensively, it's more depth than anything else. Uh, you look at the D-line, Epineza, Grousseau. Uh, you have Daquan, Ed Oliver, linebacker, Milano, Bernard. Milano Corner. Bernard. Uh, coming back, mean, They're coming Corner, back. Rasul Douglas. you got Christian Benford, Taron Johnson. you got depth with Kair Elam. And then obviously at safety, that's a little bit of a question mark with Edwards and um, with, with Rapp. But – the safeties available in this draft are not going to go in the first round. They're second round talent. Now, I understand giving up a first round pick next year is a lot to give up, but this is a young team that I think can be competitive. And I still expect them to be a playoff team that can make a run next year if things go right. So, with that said, when you get a guy like a Romo Dunze or a Malik Neighbors, you're getting a guy that's an instant impact receiver that is going to not be a huge drop-off from what you had in digs. You're going to get a guy that's around 21 years old on a rookie contract. So you're going to be able to save money at a premium position that you, you often have to pay a lot in free agency or via trade to acquire. So you're not going to have to worry put, about putting all of that, uh, uh, that much of a focus on those assets in the future. And then you also have more cap available next year to go attack other positions of need. So while you lose the draft pick, you can make up for it with some of your extra free aid, uh, money available uh, with the cap next year. So I'm not against it. I don't expect it to happen. 
But I think it is a realistic possibility, and I would consider it. Now, I'm a little bit with you. I, I don't think a trade to the teens for Brian Thomas Jr. really makes sense. But if you had to ask me what I think the most likely scenario for the Buffalo Bills is a week from today, I think it is either Adonai Mitchell or Brian Thomas Jr. in a slight move up. Not something to the teens. Assuming that Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze all go in the top 10 as expected, I believe you're going to then have the Bills waiting it out between Thomas and Mitchell. Those are the next two guys expected to go at receiver in this draft. If they start falling, say to like 18, 19, 20, then one of them is selected. I think Bean is going to start looking at the teams ahead of him who needs uh, a boundary receiver and start trying to calculate in his head, can I just swap first-round picks and maybe trade a fourth or something uh, small and not have to go crazy to move up three, four spots? Kind of like what he's done with Kyir Elam two years ago and then last year to get Dalton Kincaid. Not the major trade where you give up a ton, but a smaller trade where you ensure you get who you want. Because I understand a lot of people are saying stuff like they're concerned about uh, Mitchell with his route running and taking plays off. But there is a lot of upside there. And, and I know his tape wasn't great and that some people say he, he plays slower than what his testing is. But you're talking about a boundary receiver that ran a 4-3-4 in the combine that is 6-2, is tremendous against man and press coverage. His one main weakness is struggling against zone. Adonai Mitchell strikes me as he's future number one receiver material. Now, he comes with the risks, the risk because of diabetes, his attitude, and some of those other issues that have been leaked according to scouts and stuff like that. But I, I keep thinking it, it, it makes a lot of sense. A guy like McConkey, some of these other guys, they, they have their issues too. McConkey, a lot of a lot of scouts say he's a slot receiver at the next level, that he struggles. Uh, to be physical at the line of scrimmage. A guy like Troy Franklin, uh, his ball tracking isn't the greatest. Worthy has the elite speed, but he's not always physical, doesn't even doesn't always finish uh, the catches properly. And Leggett, great player, great prospect, but a couple years older, 23 years old, and it took him five years in the SEC to really uh, contribute at a high level. So there are a lot of question marks, but I do think that Thomas and Adonai Mitchell – Maybe not among Bills fans, but around among NFL scouts, NFL talent evaluators, are that that tier two that's in between the big three of Harrison, Neighbors, and Odunze, and then the much larger uh, tier two of the McConkeys, the Franklins, the Worthies, uh, the Legats, and so forth in that scenario. So I'll say my most likely scenario: Thomas or Mitchell in a slight trade up, but. We promised everybody we would do a mock draft, and we're gonna we're gonna get it going. AJ, uh, last good. year I I wasn't part of Trainwreck when I did it, my final mock draft, but I think I was one of basically maybe a less than a handful of people that had Dalton Kincaid uh, going to the Bills. I, I was on Cover One Roundup. Uh, Kyle and I uh, picked Kincaid after the run of receivers, and we got laughed at. By, by Dave and some of the other cover one guys. And it ended up happening. And then we were the ones uh, doing the laughing at the end. So let me let me pull this up here, AJ. Um, obviously, uh, we're going to take this slow. We're going to go to pick five, pick six, and we'll uh, examine uh, potential trade-ups. But uh, let, let's see how this gets going here. So just be one second here as I get this started. Okay, so let's uh, let's get this started right now. I'll pause it at five. Okay, so first five picks, I already see two receivers off the board. Malik Neighbors going forward to Arizona. There's some people that believe Neighbors might be the first receiver off the board. I don't think that's likely, but definitely possible. Then Marvin Harrison, uh, it's number five. AJ, you seeing this, what, what's your initial reactions? Do you think this is going to end up being a scenario that basically Romo Dunze is going to have no chance of uh, being available right now? 
Yeah, I don't think you you move up. Uh, the Giants at six, they'll probably go quarterback. I'm thinking the Titans probably go with Alt from Notre Dame. But let's see. I, I'm going to predict next two. I'm going to go J.J. McCarthy to the Giants, Alt to Tennessee, and we'll see what uh, the team at eight does. I'm not sure who it is. I can't think right now. But. What's the highest you're willing to go for Romo yeah. Duce? Is it nine? Is it no. the Chicago pick? Nine. Nine? Okay, so let's get to uh, let's get to eight, and then we can at least – Discuss the possibility if he's still available. Or Atlanta. Oh, that'd be interesting. So Atlanta in this mock draft takes him at eight. Now, I don't know if that's realistic. I don't know if Atlanta would take Romo Dunze. Um, During when now, would present with the opportunity. I mean, you, you look at Atlanta. You get a guy like Kirk Cousins as your quarterback. You already have Drake London. Uh, you have a couple. You got some talented tight ends down there. You got – an amazing running back in B. John Robinson. That's a team in the NFC that could make quite a jump this upcoming season and be a dangerous team uh, in that conference with how weak it is going forward. But let's talk about number nine. I know in this scenario, Romo Dunze is already off the board. Hypothetically, he was still available. What do you think it would take to get to number nine? And what would the Bills be willing to do in a hypothetical situation to make that happen. Yeah, I think you're looking at a first, you're obviously 28, go a fourth round pick this year. This is using a trade chart and from what I've seen. And then a first round pick for next year. And then that second round pick that the Vikings, uh, well, courtesy of the Vikings from the Texans and the Stefan Diggs trade. And then maybe sprinkle in a late day three or a day three pick next year as well. I think that would get it done. I, I think you're going to have to give up your first this year, a fourth. One of your fourths from uh, this year, and then probably give up your first and second, and then maybe a day three to sprinkle some some uh, sprinkles on top of the ice cream. But that, is that too much for you? If Odunze is there, no. But yeah, right in this situation, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm kind of with you. I don't even know. I mean, if Chicago gets thrown that offer, them being a team that's starting to take a step forward, but then also playing a rookie quarterback this season, would they be interested in that? That's a that's one that I, I struggle with because if you give Caleb Williams a receiver like Romo Dunze, like I said, in this, this mock draft he's already taken, but if Caleb Williams has a guy like Romo Dunze to go with some of the other talent they have in Chicago, I could see that offense being very good soon. Uh, yeah, that's, having, yeah, the Bears might take a receiver. Like that, so, that might be like, hey, we're not trading with you. We want like they might want Odunze. They they very well might want a Romo Dunze. And and it's it's funny that when talking about Romo Dunze, how he's kind of in a lot of fans' minds, he's the number three receiver in this class behind greats like Harrison and neighbors. But Romo Dunze is equally great. I, I think that's something that gets lost in all of this. This is a guy that is a top five talent in this draft. He's one of the best players in this draft. And if it wasn't for quarterbacks taking the first three spots, I think you could make a case that Romo Dunze is a, should be a top five, top six pick. And that's why I would be willing to pay that price. If you told me the Bills are adding a Julio Jones in his prime, the Bills are adding uh, a Jalen Waddle, a Jamar Chase, uh, a guy that's going to come to your team and be – just an absolutely dynamic playmaker. I'll tell you, you know what? I'll, I'll give up what it, what it takes for that. For a guy like Josh Allen, controlled contract, absolutely, I would be willing to give up what you mentioned earlier. But I don't think it's likely to happen, and I don't think it's something that Brandon Bean will consider. I think it's going to be a little bit too much for him to give up next year's first round pick. So. We're going we're gonna to keep it going, and then uh, I guess the next thing we're going to look at here is uh, Brian Thomas Jr. and possibly Adonai Mitchell. Adam Schefter said um, the other day that Mitchell is viewed much higher in NFL circles than a lot of fans in mock drafts. He was saying that he thinks that's going to be one of the players that goes much higher than people expect. And one last thing I do want to say about the Odunze uh, situation, Jeremy White of WGR 550 had – uh, a nice poll question uh, today uh, where he said, uh, would you rather hear the Chiefs traded all their pick, uh, the picks that the Bills would have needed to move up to nine to get Odunze 
Or would you rather the Bills traded the picks to get up to number nine and get an Odunze? And 70 percent of the votes were for the Bills to do it. Because I think even though it's easy for fans to say, I don't want to give up that much, I don't want to make that move. When you hear about your competition making that move, then it starts to scare you a little bit. And then you start to realize, well, if it would scare me if Kansas City had him, then I shouldn't be that scared for myself to make that move because I will be just as scary to other teams with a guy like that in my lineup. But uh, let's keep it going, and we'll pause it once we get to a spot that we think uh, Thomas can end up going. Dallas Turner, first defender off the board, I believe. Brock Bowers goes 12. Penix Jr. to New Orleans. Whoa. Uh, that would be that would be wild. And you know what? You're seeing a lot of people mock Penix uh, in the first round now. So we're up to 17. We still have not seen Brian Thomas Jr. off the board. I think this is where you start to wonder, could he go around this range? Um, do you see Jacksonville, Cincinnati, uh, either of them as a potential player for Brian Thomas Jr.? I mean, yeah, Jacksonville, they added Gabe, they have Christian Kirk, but they don't have uh, Calvin Ridley anymore signed with Tennessee on that monster contract that probably wasn't overpaid by a team hoping to pair a wide receiver one with Will Levis in a sophomore season. Cincy, the T. Higgins concern, who knows where that stands, so I could also see that route. The Bengals are like, well, we could extend Chase, and then we can get that rookie contract, first-round receiver, and not have to worry about Higgins after the season if he does play in Cincy, not, you know, not – Barring a trade, if he does go somewhere else, then obviously that even becomes more likely. And then, yeah, the Rams, Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, um, Steelers. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of teams could in, in this little – he'll probably go on the next four picks, Mike. Yeah, I, I, that's what I'm thinking. And what my thought process right now, if I'm the Bills and we're at pick 17, it's kind of what I just, just said like 10 minutes ago. So you still have Thomas available. You still have Adonai Mitchell available. The two guys that I think can give you that boundary uh, option with very, very high upside. My thought process is that a Thomas and an Adonai Mitchell, they have the ability to be as impactful as the top three guys that will go in this draft, but they have the question marks that uh, that it still exists with them. It, it's not – their upside it's not do they lack the potential it is more do you trust brian thomas jr to take that leap where he is the go-to guy and doesn't have a malik neighbors on the other side of him do you trust an adonai mitchell to continue developing to where the taking routes off and the diabetes and those concerns don't become an issue um that's kind of what you start to get at here so I will pause it once one of those two guys is selected, and then we'll see if it really is a possibility for the Bills to move up. Oh, my. Pause it. Pause it. So right now, we're, we're already picked 22. Neither of them are gone in this mock draft. And, and we've seen it in Kuiper's mock draft recently. We've seen it in, in a bunch of them where – in these scenarios, the Bills stay at 28 a lot of the time, and one of them goes to them. Like right now, if you're at pick 23 with the Vikings and you have five teams between you and you have two players available that you have interest in, at this right. point, I'm not even thinking of trading up. At, right. at this point, un unless one of them goes in the next two picks, I'm staying patient. Now, could Minnesota, Dallas – Green Bay, could one of them make a move? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I would like to think that those teams have some other concerns, but let's let's take it one by one and see how it goes. So now, now we're at the point where we're at pick 26. Both of them still available. One of them is going to fall to you. Well, Bill's Mafia is going to hate us in about – 10 seconds on the on the <laughs> Mitchell. It, 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 I think Bill's Mafia is going to hate us when we take one of them anyway, because I think we so many people have fallen in love with Lad McConkey and Xavier Leggett and, and the likes of them that the thought of getting someone else might not might not go well with some fans. But I, I still think the majority of the fan base would be happy if Brian Thomas was the guy at 28. 
Adonai Mitchell, on the other hand, I think you and I would be okay with it, but there'd be a lot of Bills fans that would be very upset. So let's let's see what happens the next two picks. Oh, so let's see this right here. I, I want to see if I can. Uh, Lad go. Dude, I'm telling you, Lad might go top 25, Mike. So Lad McConkey goes number 26 to Tampa, breaking the hearts of all of Bill's mafia. But the good news for you and I, we can choose between two guys that I think we both agree we would be ecstatic to be around at pick well, 28. Michael, I wouldn't be like ecstatic, but I would take him if, 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 yeah, I, I would take him if Brian Thomas Jr. wasn't there. So, okay, let, let's just have a or little bit. This is where the trade back comes in, too, Mike. Like, look, you, you're sitting here like, wow, you could get an extra third. Then you could, like, look at that. You're going to, you could trade back to like 36. You so could, let's talk it, about the possibilities. You talk about the trade back scenario right now. You, you have, a group of, I'd say, four to five guys that are worthy, no pun intended, but Xavier worthy, uh, of of being considered at pick 28 here. Talk about why you would consider trading back. What, what are your thoughts? I mean, I would go Brian Thomas Jr. Like that, that I would do it in a step of a finger if this is the case. But like, say he's off the board and this, like th- these, this was still the board available for the Bills to select from. I think you could trade back. You could get – scroll down a little bit. You could get a Leggett. You get a Worthy. I, I like Ricky Pearsall. I think he's a guy that the Bills really value. I, I think he brings a complete package. Troy Franklin, another one. Roman Wilson's an interesting prospect. Um, and then, obviously, Brennan Rice. That's a, a little down the board. But, yeah, I do not mind the trade back in a scenario where Brian Thomas Jr. is off the board. But because he is, I think Brandon Bean would do that in a snap of a finger. Um, but again, who knows? Maybe he values, maybe the Bills value those other guys more. But I, I would go BTJ, no question. But again, a trade back if Brian Thomas Jr. was off the board would be interesting. Look at yeah, Sophia in the chat, trade back. So what I what I would say is this: I, I went into this draft thinking if Thomas or Mitchell were available at 28, I was gonna take one of them. I, I definitely did not expect both of them to be available. Trade back in this scenario, is it possible? Yes, it's it's definitely possible. I think the Bills will look at a guy like Brian Thomas Mitchell. And no, now, now I'm combining their names. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. or Brian Mitchell. I think they would say too good to pass up on. Now, if Brian Thomas Jr. and Adonai Mitchell were gone and you're choosing between Lad McConkey, Xavier Leggett, Xavier Worthy, uh, Coleman, Troy Franklin, I think that's a scenario where they're like, okay, maybe we drop by, drop back 10 spots. We know there's still going to be one or two guys that we like available at that point, but uh, we can acquire some extra picks in the process. Um, it w- it would have been interesting if we didn't have Lad McConkey taken uh, two picks prior in this mock draft. But John Barker uh, in the chat. What's going on in the chat? My, my former boss, uh, Glenn Barker, BTJ, Mitchell, too many issues. So he's he's also off the Mitchell train. He he he's the diabetes bothers Glenn Barker. So that's uh that's interesting, Glenn. I, I hope the uh, wrestling gig is treating you well. I, I know you're probably enjoying it, but BTJ he thinks I, I think that's the easy pick. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm in agreement, uh, Sophia. I appreciate your comments. Uh, I honestly I I'd be perfectly fine with a, a trade back if it wasn't for those two guys being available. Uh, I see your comment earlier about Worthy Odunze. I think. Uh, same page uh, on that. I'm very open to the top six, seven, eight receivers in this class. I, I think they're that talented that regardless of what direction the bills go, they're going to end up with somebody good. But like I said, appreciate the comment, uh, Sophia, um, Glenn, Brian Thomas Jr. That, that that has to be the pick if you have the choice. I think between we could have fun and, Mike, and trade back, but then like I would like go to bed tonight being like, dude, if the Bills actually traded back on draft night with Brian Thomas Jr. on the board, like, I, I, I would you'd be I would be upset. Uh, I'll be real. I, I would be upset in that scenario. Uh, if Brian Thomas Jr. is on the board at twenty eight. I I'm feeling like we just hit a home run. We just we got one of the top four wide receivers. We didn't have to give up assets. We didn't have to move up. I would be going to bed loving it uh, at this point in time. 
Uh, and then one more comment here. Yeah, um, check it out. Check out other best options available. Let's uh, let's just take a look at some of the uh, other options available in this draft. Uh, let's see if I can check D tackle right here. So you do have uh, oh. Newton from uh, Illinois. That would be a tempting guy in a scenario where maybe some more of the top receivers were, were off the board. Top 30 visit, seven and a half sacks last year, good production, kind of redundant at Oliver, but what's what's wrong with having two at Olivers? I don't think that's an issue. That's And that's then issue. safety, it's too early. The, uh, these guys, just none yeah. of them really first-round grades. You're not going to really help out uh, in that scenario. Uh, defensive end. <laughs> I, mean, I like Darius Robinson too, but. Uh, let's see any other positions. Uh, I know some people like Cooper DeJohn out of Iowa, but not really the spot, in my opinion. I know the Bills no, had Brian a Brian Thomas player. Jr. on the board. Yeah, so I, I think for, for this mock draft right now, um, we're going we're gonna to go forward with Brian Thomas Jr., but appreciate the input uh, from everybody right here. And then uh, we're going to let this go a little bit once uh, this ESPN simulator actually makes the pick. Now, what are you thinking right now? You just got Brian Thomas Jr., uh, great day one. Uh, are you hoping to make a move day two to get anybody? No. Are you sitting back at 60? What, what is your thought process? Uh, I would rather I would rather think about trading back into the third round using a couple of those fourth round picks. You might have you might have to package it with a, a pick from next year, but I, I would I would be content with staying at 60 and at this point keeping those picks and letting you know some guys fight for roster spots in the later rounds come in August. I think I'm in agreement with you. Uh, once we get a guy like Brian Thomas Jr., my opinion of an early double dip kind of goes out the door. I'm still okay with a double dip, but not for second round. It would have to be maybe first and fourth round uh, in that scenario and, and kind of evaluate uh, who are your – options available at that time. So let's just set, let this roll to 60 and uh, see who's on the board at that point. And then we'll go much quicker for, for the rest of the draft. After well, next to Tennessee, after. love us some competition. Frazier, he's been worthy 41 to Green Bay. That, that would be uh, an interesting spot. Neyland, he was top 30. I like McMillan. Javon Baker, 55 to Miami. Oh my goodness. Uh, there would be, a lot of there'd be a lot of cover one guys that'd be upset to see Javon Baker uh, gone, especially to Miami. That would be, I, I think, some some of their worst nightmares. Uh, my former friends over at Cover One, um, my former buddies over there. So let's uh, discuss it uh, right now, AJ. I think most fans at this point I like Pierce All, bro. But so, okay, so I, I just said no chance of the double dip first round. Uh, second round at receiver. Let's just talk about some of these guys first, and then we can go through other options. You still have a scenario where you got Pearsall on the board, Troy Franklin, Roman Wilson, Keon Coleman. Those are some guys, but you just got Brian Thomas Jr. Jermaine Burton. I personally can't do the double dip with Brian Thomas Jr., no, Taken? no, no. Because Unless, you, can, you can probably get a Roman Wilson maybe in the third trade up or something. We'll, we'll see. Dude. Now, like, if had you gotten a guy like Lad McConkey or one of those other uh, guys at twenty eight, you'd see some of the talent here. You'd be like, "Damn, I can, I can add on top of that, and I can get two studs." But once you got Brian Thomas Jr., I think that has to take wide receiver out of the picture. What positions are you looking at at just, six? Feet? Just go to the top of the uh, go to the top of the board, like every position. Okay, let's see. So th there is some there is some good talent. You, to Vondre Sweat, um, you can see uh, you already mentioned Pearsall. Um, I like Cole Bishop from Utah uh, for do it all guy. The, the, that would probably, if I'm looking at that board, over, I over the board? Bowl, I, I, if I look at that board right now, I talked to him at the senior bowl. He had a great, great relationship with Dalton Kincaid. I think he brings the full package. He can play depth. He can play closer to the box. He's sticky in coverage. He, I think he has to work a little bit more on his physicality. But I think Cole Bishop 
would be a, a solid addition and good value at 60. Um, Bullard, I know people like too. He, he's an interesting prospect, but I just think Bishop's more of a, a Bills-esque pick. I, I think they like him. Cameron Kitchens, yeah, I know. Like, could, could you wait and get a Cameron Kitchens? I really like Cameron Kitchens. His, his stock fell at the combine. Again, very instinctual, can really read the field, very good at being a ball hawk. I, I don't know, man. Like, do you I, I, the thing that's interesting about Kitchens is he, he seems like he's on a massive slide right now. People were talking about him as a, a day two pick, uh, a possible early day two pick, uh, heading into the the offseason, right around the end of uh, the college football season. Do you really think that now he's the 108th best prospect, or could he be in the conversation uh, at pick number 60? I think he'd be a day two guy, so second and third round. I would probably lean towards – if I had to guess where Cameron Kitchens is going to go, I would lean like top of the third, late second. So, yeah, I, I think the Bills could could pull the trigger there. But I do – I like Cole Bishop here. Check out the uh, DNs in uh, offensive line. Okay. So, DN, there's not really a ton. Nothing, nothing. Here at this point. And then if we go offensive line, let me pull that up. Um uh, I'll check O tackle first. There is some talent still on the offensive line. I just don't know if that's something that yeah, Lyle Collins. Point, and all yeah, I, 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 I just don't think it's. I, I'm with you. Cole Bishop's available. Uh, the Bills definitely need to upgrade their safety depth right now. Um, that's a concern position heading into the year with Taylor Rapp and, and Edwards. We'll take Cole Bishop in this uh, in this mock, and then we'll keep it going. Uh, obviously, as we get later, we're going to spend a little less time talking about these prospects. Uh, we'll, we'll be a little bit more rapid fire in that scenario. But if there's anything that stands out, Troy Franklin, 62 to the Ravens. Keon Coleman to the Chiefs. What, how, what would you think about that? Keon Coleman on the Chiefs. Would that, would that scare you at all, or would you just be – yeah, I think he's I think he's a good player. I think he plays faster than what his 40 time said. And I think there's a little just like the, the Mitchell stuff, I, I think it's a little over dramatized at this point, but who knows? Maybe he is not that guy. I think Maybe Coleman. He's not him. I think Coleman will be a good player in the NFL. I don't think he's gonna be a great player, but I do think people All right, pause it at sorry to cut you off. Pause it like right. right here. Yeah. Okay. See who's available. Okay, so let's look at the big board right now. So there's still some good guys uh, left on this board right now. Uh, King Carter, dude. Versatile defensive tackle. Could play outside as well. 6'2", over 300 pounds, three-year starter, captain. Do you think the Bills are thinking about trading – using some of their late picks to, to acquire absolutely more picks in the fourth, fifth round absolutely. because they're, they're loaded up late. Right. Day right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that could be a possibility for the sake of this. I'm, I'm not going to speculate on, on trade-ups and stuff yeah, like that. Either. But uh, if anything pops up, just let me know. And we can always explore that. If Dwayne Carter gets to like 115. Nope. <laughs> Once you get to the fourth round, it's it's finding those sleepers. It's it's always about finding that that guy that you you, you love and for whatever Something reason. Or something. Let's see anybody here getting closer to the Bills pick one twenty eight right now. So what are you thinking at one twenty eight? Are you trying to fill positional depth uh, somewhere on the team? Are you looking for someone that could uh, develop into something? Uh, down the right down the road do you have anything specific that you're looking for here yeah probably power back Marshawn Lloyd does stand out he was at the senior bowl very good pass blocking uh target they do I still feel like the bills need to upgrade that running back room I know Ty Johnson had a really good year especially towards the end and I think James Cook obviously has developed into a RB1 but I think a, a developmental power back would be interesting I also like the idea of you know, D tackle. I think that's interesting as well. D end, O line. Any, any, anything you can add at that point along the trenches would be a 
good ad. I, I think being – I'd be shocked if they don't add someone in the top with their first three picks along the offensive line or defensive line. You uh, you mentioned Lloyd. Is that is that someone value-wise you, you like here in the fourth round at 128? Yeah, power back, great pass blocker. I think he had good production at USC, obviously play. Let me check because I'm going to go on a limb here. I don't want to be wrong. Um, he was – so he's undersized, 5'9", so a smaller back but 215. So obviously he plays bigger than 5'9". Uh, in his last season, he had pretty solid production, 820 yards and nine touchdowns um, with USC. Obviously, Caleb Williams was there, so they were throwing a lot. And then sh- has shown some pass catching ability, 13 catches for 230 yards. So an interesting prospect. It's, it was He transferred to USC. He spent his first three years in South Carolina. So I'm going to let you convince me of that. Uh it seems like a good, uh, good pick. Well, let's for see the, the D line. Well, let's see. How, I want to see D line because I yeah. Don't... Let's see. Let's see defensive line here as well. Uh, start with D tackle. Uh, according to the ESPN analytics, some of these guys are are still lower ranked than where we're at right now. Not to say that they can't be a consideration. Is um, Gabe Hall still available? Doesn't look like it. Yep, actually, no, he he oh, they he actually have a very low him. low rating. They have him at 234. Okay. I, I think at this point, if we if we were doing the mock draft, just I, I know these are just one person's opinions with these rankings that that's not what teams are gonna have their boards looking like. But if you're at pick 128 and you have a guy that is considered a top 75 prospect available at a position where you could use a little bit of a boost. I know James Cook is uh, is the bell cow, but there is questions about Ty Johnson being the backup. I like Ty Johnson, but uh, I, they could definitely use some extra help. Uh, are you okay with with Lloyd being the pick here? Yeah. All right, we'll take Lloyd. And then, like I said, we'll uh, kind of go faster with uh, these remaining picks. Uh, another one here at 133. Uh, can you, like, click on that? Like, can you click on that Caden Wallace? Yeah. Nittany Lion guy? And then yeah, see let me. Uh, they're not letting me uh, pull anything up on Caden Wallace, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. All these simulators are different, but, yeah, they, they, they'll just let you make the pick, but they won't let you do anything beyond that. Got it. I'll ask you this. Do you, do you think it's – I know once you get to the fourth round, this is where the, the people that truly do their homework, um, they cherish, they love it. Do you want to keep going at this point? Up to you. I mean, we're, we're almost on an hour. I mean, yeah. Let Let's just wrap up the the mock draft part right now, and then we'll we'll just wrap up and shim it. give our our finishing thoughts. All right. So, in this mock draft that we did, I, I know we we promised seven rounds. We we finished after uh, four. I I hope you guys don't grill us for that. But if you're leaving the draft and you know that you you got Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU and you got him by staying at 28. You added a Cole Bishop and then you add the running back from USC. Regardless of what happens with the remaining picks, which there's a bunch of them, and I'm sure there's going to be good guys that are, are taken later. How are you feeling about that, Paul, uh, heading into uh, the remainder of the offseason? Yeah, if I'm the Bills, I'm happy with, obviously, BTJ, Cole Bishop. I think, I think we've Covered it quite well. I think Brian Thomas Jr. would be obviously an instant impact player on the boundary. Provides that deep threat speed. Obviously, very good ball control, good hands, everything you want in a receiver. And then, uh, yeah, Cole Bishop, again, very versatile piece. Lloyd, that 5'9", 215, undersized guy, but plays like he's three, you know, 6'4", with with the way he runs runs through people. So I, I do like those three selections. And I think, again, Brandon Bean will add in the trenches. Um, but again, we don't really know who they value. And I, I don't really know too in depth about the names at the back end of this draft in terms of on the trenches. There, there's a couple of guys like Gabe Hall. I would love if they drafted from Baylor in the third round. I think he has upside. I think he's 6'6", 290. He obviously has, needs some polish and nuance to his game if he's 6'6", 290 and not being taken in the top 100 picks or whatever it may be. But um, there are some guys, Jordan Jefferson from LSU, I think is a possibility. So there are some guys in the later rounds that, 
um, you know, the Bills could attack on the trenches, and that's what I think they will end up doing. Yeah, I, I would love the Hall. I would be feeling amazing about this team uh, heading into minicamp. If, if if I knew we had Brian Thomas Jr., Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel as the wideouts with Dalton Kincaid as my primary number one target tight end, uh, with James Cook in the backfield, Josh Allen at quarterback, this offensive line, I feel like we'd be looking at a top, a top ranked offense once again. Uh, that would finish in the one, two, three area. Even if there is some defensive regression with some of the guys that you that you, they lost this offseason, I think you're looking at a very talented Bills team, one that will still be near the top of the AFC despite the national narrative that their window uh, has closed. So watch out for the Jets. What was that? Watch out for the Jets. Just <laughs> I feel like uh, I don't know if you're trying to get a reaction out of me with Dude. that. We said it last year about them. We thought they were the scarier team. We might have been one year too late because I'm talking. If I, well, and that's you know, I'm assuming Rodgers. I'm guess. assuming Rodgers, Garrett Wilson, Mike Williams. They they fortified that offensive line. I know there's a lot of injury concerns on that offensive line, but yeah, you have a healthy Brees Hall coming back. That defense is is very good. Um, they traded for Hassan Reddick from Philly, so they do have. If there's one team that can stop Josh Allen or at least limit him, it's the, it's the New York Jets. And if they have any ounce of offense, they, they, they beat him, they beat the Bills with Mike White and Zach Wilson. I mean, hey, man, who knows? Yeah, good points. I mean, I, I was saying that stuff last year, and then the Bills lost to the Jets uh, week one. So if there is a team that gives the Bills a, a lot of trouble, it is the New York Jets. Hopefully Aaron Rodgers doesn't play like – any older version of him. Hopefully he is washed up for the sake of Bills fans. Uh, don't want don't want to root against the guy. He is one of the living legends in football. But uh, for Bills fans' sake, uh, hopefully Aaron Rodgers is not the old version of himself. But AJ, thank you for giving me an hour of your time on the, the Bunt Takes pod today. Uh, enjoyed this mock draft. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we gave a lot of solid information. And based on your opinions, my opinions, I think there's a lot of different – uh, exciting routes for the Bills to go uh, next Thursday night. But before we wrap up, uh, just talk about where people can find your content, what you're up to, uh, and uh, basically how to find more of your uh, more of your stuff going forward. Yeah, so I am at AJ Sobalski on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call that. Uh, consistent Bills coverage, a lot of press conference takeaways, um, takes, a lot of – Thoughts on instantaneous, like breaking news with the Bills, stuff like that. I, I float around like some. I love Noah Khan, the musician. I'll tweet about him sometimes. I like. I, I tweet about the Saber sometimes. I love chicken wings. I'm starting a little wing review uh, that I'm going around Buffalo and trying some wings, and that'll be fun. And then, of course, I'm with the Matavi Daily News. Find all my work there uh, at the Daily News I write about the Bills, high school sports, even some Sabers as well. And I, we, you know, I'm going to hint at it. I'm not going to give it away, but we will, me and my partner, Alex Brasky, who's been there for quite some time, my editor, will be starting a podcast, and we are going live from TF Browns, a nice spot in Bat Batavia. Very good wings, by the way. Uh, I know they're not Buffalo, but they're, they're, they're top-notch stuff. Um, on Wednesday, we'll have really good guests, very good guests um, that – a lot of you will know. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm not going to leak the name yet because it hasn't been announced, but just know that that is coming shortly. And that's where you can find me on probably all platforms moving forward as well. Spotify, Megaphone, you'll, you'll, it'll be on the Batavia News YouTube channel. Appreciate you coming on, AJ. Uh, as for myself, uh, the Bunt Takes Pod, this is newer to Trainwreck. We're going to have a template. We're going to we're gonna have a lot of stuff coming out in the near future. Uh, basically, just the beginning uh, of this right now, also part of the pay the pod, uh, pay the bills pod with train wreck. So we have podcasts coming out left and right all the time at train wreck sports, but please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you're watching this uh, on YouTube right now, appreciate any likes, comments, interaction uh, that you have, but for AJ Sabalski, Mike Bunt, thanks for uh, watching our show and have a great night. And let's hope for a great Buffalo Bills draft one week from now.